Hi. So in this second part uh, section, we're going to be starting to use the formulas for uh, probability because when certain events happen in a certain way, it's not as easy to calculate it with just directly like we did in the first section. We have other formulas that we can use that will help us and actually identify the event more clearly and get more accurate probability values. So for example, the first one we could talk about is the complementary events, where complementary events mean that what if one doesn't occur? What's that probability? So the complement we use, we can be reminded that the complement used to be um, in sets. Remember, we put A sub C, I mean, A with the C superscript, because um, that was everything outside the set, right? And then with logic, we use complements with using the negation, like not A. And we said, okay, if it's not true, it's false. So the complement is exactly a derived just from that. So the complement is exactly that everything not that event. So the complement of event is just, the complement of event E is that the event does not occur. So the probability of a complement of event is just because the maximum is 100% one, we just take one minus the probability of that event occurring. But Jonas too, like the probability of event occurring is one minus the probability of that event not occurring. So we can use this statement here for um, and move the numbers around um, to you know satisfy whatever we need, what probability we need. So using Bucky's deck of cards from example 10.3, what is the probability for Satchel not to draw a queen? So the probability of not drawing a queen is equal to one minus the probability. Well, this is the complement, right? If event E is drawing the queen, then the complement of that event is not drawing a queen, right? So if I so the probability of not drawing a queen is one minus the probability of drawing the queen. Well, I know this. I know it's going to be one minus the probability of drawing a queen is the probability of drawing any one type of card. There's four queens in the deck. So it'll be four out of 52. So here, if I do one minus four out of 52, I could do this on the calculator. I could do 1 minus 4 divided by 52. It might give me some fraction, I mean some decimal here, but once again I could go ahead and hit second table and it gives me that fraction to decimal number. And it says 12 out of 13. So notice it even gives it to you in a reduced fraction. And then I could say, okay, it was approximately that decimal, 0.92. 31, or I can move the decimal over and say 92.31%. Any one of those answers, whichever one the problem asks for, um, usually with deck of cards, we leave the fraction. So the complement, usually the key word there, and I want to say is not. Okay, not. And that's and that comes from these, right? Remember I said, oh, just think of the complement of A means that what elements are not in A, right? If it's, um, if it's uh, you know, not true, right, it's false. So the word not comes in when it comes to the complement and the negation. Okay, so going into the probability of two independent events, Suppose two events occur, A and B, if the probability of event B occurring is the same whether or not event A occurs, then A and B are independent events. For example, if I were to have a six-sided die and I roll it and I get some number and I pick it up and I'm going to roll it one more time, on that second roll, 
does it matter whether or not I rolled a six? Like, will that affect what roll or face it lands on when I roll it the second time? How about when I toss a coin? I toss a coin, it comes in, I put it here, heads or tails. And then I'm going to toss it again because it's like not what I want. I'm like, but two out of three, right? And I toss it again. Will that tails that I tossed earlier in the first toss affect whether or not I'm going to get heads or tails in the second? Like just because I got tails first, does that mean I'm going to get a tails again? Right? So, um... The answer is no, right? So those are independent events because the f second event doesn't isn't affected by the first. Sometimes they are and sometimes they're not, you know, and th those are other formulas. But um, here we have to think about, okay, if I draw one, will that, does that affect like what I'm going to do on the second, the second round of events? Okay, so when Satchel draws a card, he puts it back in the deck before drawing another card. What if Satchel draws a card and does not replace the card back into the deck? Let's say Satchel draws a heart. If Satchel had replaced the spade before drawing the heart, how would this probability be different from when he did not replace the spade? So once again, we're going to have two situations here. Notice that word not comes in, right? So we have two situations. The first situation is that Satchel replaces the card, right? Okay, the second situation, which we're going to write over here, is when Satchel doesn't replace the card. Okay, so let's look here. So here, I'm going to put little hangman pieces. I'm going to put first draw, and then over here I'm going to put second draw. And over here I'm going to put first draw. And oh yeah, I'm gonna put second draw. <laughs> okay, so let's start with first phase. So the first phase is that Satchel draws a um, heart, or I'm sorry, a spade and then a heart. So on the first draw, he had how many spades in the in the deck, right? So if we just go back to the picture up here of cards, we can see that there are 13 of any cards, right? So 13 spades and 13 hearts. Okay, and there's a total of 52 cards total. So we do know that there's going to be, in this case, when Satchel replaces the card, so just on the first draw, there's 52 cards in the deck and 13 spades. Right, so then he puts back the spade so now when he draws it out, there's 51 cards sitting there, right? But then once he puts it back in, he doesn't have 51 anymore. He puts the card back and then he still has 52 cards. And in there, that 52 cards still remains as you select the next card. So when Satchel draws that heart, there's 13 hearts in there, but the 52 out of the 52 cards still remain because Satchel replaces that card. Well, if we go over here to where Satchel doesn't replace the card, so now the first draw is the same, right? 13 out of 52, right? Draws that in there, 13 spades, comes out. He's holding the card, okay? If he's holding the card, and this is where it gets a little tricky, how many cards left in the deck? He's holding one card, there was 52, but now he's holding one of them. So now how many cards left? 51 cards, right? But how many hearts? Well, there's still thir the whole suit of hearts. He only picked a spade, but not a heart, right? So he still has 13 hearts in the deck, but he no longer has 52 cards to pick from. When he picks that heart, he doesn't have 52 cards there because he's holding one that's a spade. So how many cards left? Well, now instead of the whole deck, he only has... 51 cards in that deck. So notice that here, the second draw here, that probability is changing due to the fact that he drew a card first and didn't replace the card. 
So these are not independent events. Right? They're not independent because independent says that on this second draw, it wouldn't change the, out the outcome. It's still likely, equally likely events. It's not equal. These would have to be 52 to be equal, right? I got one less card in there and that changed my probability on that second event. Therefore, it's not independent. However, when Satchel replaced the card, and this out of the likelihood was equally likely to pick, right, out of the same number of cards, these are deep, uh, independent events. So you just need to see the word, some key words are with replacement, without replacement. Um, we always assume without replacement. We always assume that if we eat a cookie from the cookie jar, we're not gonna eat it and throw it up and put it back together in the cookie jar, right? We eat it, it's gone, right? So there's one less cookie in the cookie jar. We draw a card, we assume we never put it back, you know, and there's one less card in the deck. So it's really important that in real life, we do see that there are times where it's most likely always going to be not independent. But sometimes like when you're flipping a coin or rolling a die, owning a dog, those are independent. If your neighbor owns a dog and you own a dog, those choices were independent of each other. And so um, those are independent. So there's some times where there are going to be clearly independent, but most of the time we assume without replacement. Okay, so let's try an example. So um, suppose it will rain tomorrow in Houston, Texas, and also rain tomorrow in Galveston, Texas, near a city. Are these two independent events? So think about it. If it rains to, in your city, do you think it's likely it's going to rain in a nearby city? Right? So some students say no, right? And that's not really true. Think about when it rains, like, and you have a friend in a different town, like LA or somewhere, and does it usually rain there if it rains in our town? And it does, right? So if it rains nearby, it's gonna rain probably near you. So these are not independent events, right? Because these are not independent events. Because it is likely to rain in nearby cities. Okay, and I think that's why we need to really think about independence and dependent, right? The weather is very dependent on what's happening with the world, like the vortex, the cold vortex. And if there is tsunami somewhere, most likely we're gonna get some sort of weird weather pattern you know, across the world. So it's really, it's really interesting how weather is uh, our dependent events, even though we feel like, you know, the Eastern hemisphere is so far away from us, but it's not. Okay. So the formula for in independent events, remember when Satchel replaces the card, it's just taking the product of the two. That's all you have to do. So two events are independent and then just find the probability of each and multiply them. So let's go back to that one. Let's go back to the one where Satchel drew the heart first and then replaced the card and then the spade. So let's go up here. So when he replaced the card and there were, we knew that we'd identify their independent events, here's the probability on that first draw and the second draw. So we already know the, the fractions for each, right? So the probability of drawing a heart first and a spade is equal to the probability of drawing a heart times the probability of drawing a spade, right? Given that these are independent events. Well, we said this was 13 out of 52 times 13 out of 52. So we could easily put this in the calculator if you like. Um, you could do it by hand. There's so many ways. So 13 out of 52 times 13 out of 52. 
and it's 0 0.0625. We can put that in a fraction by hitting second table, which gives us the fraction to decimal, and it's 1 16th. And remember, 1 16th was actually equal to 0 0.0625 right or I could put it as a percent 6.25 percent either either one of these are totally acceptable just depending on what they're asking for so the chance the the probability of satchel going as the deck drawing a heart and then a spade with the same amount in each draw is about 6.25 percent so just so you know that's a pretty low percent right <laughs> all right let's try one more so in a drawer, there are 10 pairs of socks, six of which are white, and seven t-shirts, three of which are white. What is the probability of randomly selecting a white pair of socks and a white t-shirt? So let's write this out. So the probability of selecting a white socks and white shirt we could put TS for shirt, t-shirt, is equal to, well, we have to think, are these independent events? If I go in and pick socks, am I going to grab a shirt, right? Am I going to wear socks for a shirt or shirt for socks? And of course, my, my 10-year-old son is, would say, yeah, of course, you know, but really, we're not going to wear socks and shirts and shirts and socks. So those, I would say, are independent events because we wouldn't we would know that the likelihood of picking two pairs of socks, one for a shirt, is unlikely, right? So these are definitely going to be independent events. And again, the reason why they're going to be independent events is because is it likely that I'm picking a pair of socks, would I pick a second pair of socks to wear as a t-shirt in place of a shirt? And the answer would be no. So then we know that there, if I pick a pair of socks, it's not going to really change how I'm going to pick a shirt, right? So um, the probability of uh, picking a white pair of socks is the number of white socks in the drawer out of the total number of garments times, or um, not I guess garments meaning the socks. Here we go. Times the number of white t-shirts all over the number of shirt t-shirts in the drawer. Okay, so there are six white socks out of ten. times um, seven t-shirts, three of which are white. So three out of seven. And if I multiply this, I could get 18 out of 70. And so if I wanted to go ahead, I could have put this in the calculator as well, multiplying the fractions. I also could go ahead and just see if I could reduce this fraction by hitting 18 divided by 7, 70, and get 0.25, hit the second fraction to decimal, and get 9 out of 35. So this will be approximate, uh, sorry, this is, we want to reduce the fraction always where possible, so this would be 9 out of 35, which is approximately... 0.2571 or 25.71%. So those are three, you don't need all three, but it's, I just like putting them there just so you can see all the three different answers that you may be asked in the course of this class. And so you can know how to convert all of them. I always encourage using the calculator because the calculator converts really nicely. And then all you're responsible for really is rounding and then moving that decimal over if needed for the percent. So we know that here, um, we wanna always ask now, like are they independent events? 
Notice that we have the word and associated with independent events. So if we go up here, we want to be very, very clear here that only when it's an and will we multiply. So and means that you multiply events. So the word and is associated with the arithmetic operation multiplying. And we're going to have an and, huh? And should remind you of something very special. In sets, and was what? Intersection. And remember in logic was that little, it looked like a little upside down V, right? Coffee and cream. And so um, this and pops up everywhere. And now that it's in probability for us, it means multiplication. 